Liberal Viewer presents. So, welcome to Liberal Viewer Sunday Live Clip Roundup. Thanks for joining me. I picked out 35 of the weekend's best clips, uh, mostly from the Sunday morning news analysis shows this morning from the corporate media here in the United States, meaning the big five corporate outlets of ABC, NBC, CBS, CNN, and Fox News. Plus, I'll be adding in the usual quasi-news political comedy clips uh, from HBO's Real Time with Bill Maher from last Friday, and I'll also uh, be covering the topics you can see listed down in the video description, and if you're watching this as a recorded show, you should see time indexes down there to skip to the topics that interest you. I'll start with about a dozen clips on last Tuesday's election results, uh, generally what happened and what it means, and then I'll have about a half dozen clips on immigration, uh, which is looking like it's going to be the first big issue of conflict between the new Republican Congress and the president. I'll also have about 10 clips on the other big news of the week, which was President Obama's announcement that he's putting 1,500 more U.S. troops in Iraq, doubling the number that are there. And then I'll end with some final clips on the implications of this week's uh, midterms for the 2016 presidential election. And... Uh, the clip I want to start with kind of connects between both presidential and congressional politics because it's on the topic of the Republican war on women and how that issue didn't work well for Democrats this year, which Bill Maher tried to get former Friends actress Lisa Kudrow to comment on, and uh, he seemed to have to explain to her what the Republican war on women is, as I'll discuss after I show you that clip from the real-time overtime segment available on Full On YouTube in full on YouTube that you can see over here. Lisa will give you the last question. Hunter D, on the TV show Scandal, you played a congresswoman and made a powerful speech on sexism. <laughs> uh-huh, <Do> yeah, you... <laughs> that's right. What is your favorite color? No. Uh, <laughs> do, you, do you feel that the Republican war on women is still an important issue to voters? The, the Republican war on women? That's what it says. Do you feel that the Republican war on women is still an important issue to voters? You know, you, There's a Republican war on women? To, yeah. <laughs> Which yeah. part of being a woman? Well, you know, I think he's referring back to... Now, this is something the Republicans yeah. did improve upon, I must say. Back in 2010, they were the legitimate rape people. They, were the, they could not stop uh, talking yeah. about ladies' private parts. Yeah. And this time they got the memo, I guess, from Karl Rove, who said, you know what, just ixnay on talking about women's and abortion. You know, we'd stop with, you know, we're the Republicans. We want to fuck the living. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I got to go. Thank you very much. <laughs> so I watched that clip a few times, and at first I thought Lisa... Uh, Kudrow really didn't understand the concept of the war on women, but having rewatched it, I almost get the feeling that Lisa Kudrow is a Republican or leaning in that direction at least, though I don't have any information as to whether she's ever stated her political beliefs, so I could be totally wrong about that. And if you know one way or the other, you can let me know down in the comment section. But it wasn't just uh, the campaign slogan about the war on women that didn't work uh, in this last midterm election. Uh, Democrats didn't turn out a lot of important constituencies and they lost uh, white people, especially white men and working class whites as well uh, in really large numbers. And I thought uh, Chuck Ta uh, Todd on uh, NBC's Meet the Press explained that uh, pretty clearly with some good numbers this morning over in the next clip I want to show you over here. Spin. Not only did Republicans win Senate control, they are poised to hold their largest majority in the House since Herbert Hoover was president. It's a firewall that could take Democrats a decade. You know, I won't. How did it happen? In early 2014, Democrats had a game plan to run on a populist economic message. An opportunity for all. Expand opportunity, build new ladders of opportunity. Opportunity is who we are. So join the rest of the country. Say yes. Give America a raise. Instead, while four red states approved minimum wage hikes by large margins on Tuesday, Democratic candidates largely abandoned the populist call to arms. 
They have successfully uh, made this campaign a, a referendum on President Obama, which I do not believe would be all that uh, important if we as Democrats had uh, done uh, a better job on messaging exactly what the president uh, has done. Senate Democrats also insisted the president delay executive action on immigration to save their red state candidates, particularly in the South. Not only didn't it work, it may have hurt some Democrats in states with large Hispanic populations. In Florida, where Democrat Charlie Crist narrowly lost the governor's race, the Latino electorate dipped from 17% in 2012 to 13% in 2014. And in Colorado, Republican Cory Gardner improved on Republicans' 2010 showing in 20 out of 21 counties that had the largest Hispanic populations. To win, Democrats believe they needed their base voters to come out, and they made the election a project of assembling those coalition groups. That didn't work either. Instead, young voters, single women, African Americans, and Latinos posted numbers that looked more like the Democrats' 2010 shellacking than Obama's 2012 victory, leading even Democrats to ask, does the Obama coalition exist without Obama on the ballot? And Democrats have a growing problem with white working class voters. In 2008, John McCain won whites with incomes under $50,000 by just four points. But in the last three elections, white voters, and particularly white men, have broken for Republicans by huge margins. This year, the GOP won white non-college graduates by 30 points. How does the party refresh itself? Don't expect new faces to lead the Democrats in Congress. Both Reid and Nancy Pelosi are expected to keep their leadership positions. Instead, the challenge of remaking the party for the next election will fall at the feet of another familiar face, Hillary Clinton. Hmm. So, yeah, I thought that was an interesting analysis from Chuck Todd, and especially about the way that uh, the Democrats totally lost the white vote, especially the white male working class vote. And that's even though they did all these things to try to keep the vote. And I mentioned back uh, when President Obama was last considering doing executive action to uh, defer deportations and uh, stop, you know, people who are here, uh, undocumented immigrants from uh, being sent home if they're otherwise law-abiding and they're, you know, working in our communities. And uh, I said back then that I thought that it was a bad idea for President Obama to put the decision off to try to win these seats uh, because it was going to hurt his uh, turnout with uh, the Latino voters, and that seems to have been borne out by the numbers that you saw in Chuck Todd's report there, and I'm going to get uh, more to the immigration issue later. Like I said, I'm going to have several clips specifically on that and whether President Obama is going to be taking executive action. Uh, but on the uh, question of uh, how the Republicans win won over those white voters, uh, the white working class voters especially, I think it is in some ways because Republicans kind of hid their principles. They ran a negative anti-Obama campaign. And uh, I want to show a clip from Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders, who may be running for president. I'm actually going to talk about him a little bit at the end when I talk about the 2016 presidential election. Uh, but he he was over on HBO's Real Time with Bill Maher last Friday. And here's a clip of him talking about how Republicans hid their principles, especially on, you know, basic uh, issues that are really important to working class people uh, over in this clip. But here's the interesting point. You talk about Republican principles. The Republicans forgot to tell the American people what their principles are. So let me make a prediction. <laughs> but it didn't that's matter. That's right. So let me, right. Bill, let me make a prediction. And a year from now, invite me back. We'll see if I'm right or wrong. This is exactly what they will do. The American people want to expand Social Security. What the Republicans will do is attempt to cut Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid and give huge tax breaks to the wealthy and large corporations. They will do exactly what the American people do not want them to do. You talked about well, raising the minimum wage. Right. They don't believe in that. They want to do away with the concept of the minimum wage so people will work for five bucks or four bucks they, an hour. So I, I think that that is true, that by running this anti-Obama campaign, the Republicans didn't have to run positively on much of anything. Uh, and so they got to hide some of their uh, principles that aren't very 
helpful for the working class people that they overwhelmingly won according to those numbers you saw before and uh, one of the interesting things about that is that it's not just the Republicans who didn't have a message it was also the Democrats who didn't have a great message in this election like I said they didn't stand up for their principles on immigration and they didn't stand up for a lot of principles and I the person who I thought put it best was a uh, former uh, another a person from uh, Vermont, former Vermont Governor uh, Howard Dean, uh, who also uh, led the Democratic Party for a while after his uh, failed run for the presidency, and I, I thought he kind of described how the Democrats did not have principles to run on in this last election either over here. You got to do the 50 state strategy again. The, 50, the president has been brilliant at the 50 state strategy, but not so uh, the DNC hasn't been able to pull that back together again for a variety of reasons, not all having to do with the DNC. Uh, the biggest problem, Jim Clyburn was the most right person in that uh, lead up. Uh, it was message. Uh, sure, it was an off year and we can make all these excuses, right. but the fact is we have never been able to, and even through the days of the 50 state strategy and, you know, taking over the House, the Senate and the president in four years when I was running the DNC, I could never get the Washington Democrats to stay on message. Their, the Republican message was, we're not Obama. No substance whatsoever, we're not Obama. What was the Democrats' message? Oh, well, we're really not either. <laughs> you cannot win if you are afraid. Too? <laughs> yeah, I mean, is that, is that... It, it, sounded, it felt like it. Yeah. Where the hell is the Democratic Party? So, You've got to stand for something if Dan, you want to win. Dan Ball. <laughs> yeah, I thought that was kind of amusing. I hope you enjoyed that clip of Howard Dean. That, that's one of my uh, favorite comedic clips that doesn't come from a comedy show from, for the night, I guess. Uh, uh, Howard Dean kind of disqualified disqualified himself from being a presidential candidate because he did kind of a funny voice at uh, a campaign uh, speech what was it New Hampshire I can't remember which it was some primary loss either Iowa New Hampshire somewhere in there and he did his whole yeehaw speech and I guess he's still doing the funny voices anyway and I kind of enjoyed that funny voice so you can let me know if you enjoyed it and uh, I also want to show a, a clip from Bill Maher's monologue on a, a real comedy clip where he also talked about how some of the Democratic principles won in the midterm elections, even though the candidates didn't win. You know, uh, like the minimum wage was on the ballot in several states and won everywhere it was on the ballot. Uh, and uh, you can see Bill Maher kind of making fun of that uh, and some of the drug issues that were on the ballot, marijuana legalization and something happened in California that he doesn't really refer to that I'll talk about. Uh, after I show you that clip here. And I tell you, what's so frustrating for liberals is that everywhere where there were specific issues on the ballots, like minimum wage, like gun control, all these things that liberals wanted, they won overwhelmingly, and then the people voted for the very representatives who are going to block them. They voted to legalize pot in Washington, D.C., which gives me a great idea for Michelle Obama's garden. <laughs> I... <laughs> but yes, pot had a very good day. Oregon and Alaska, welcome to the party. Oregon and Alaska passed legal pot. It is four states now. Four states now have legal pot. Pot, by the way, marijuana was also on the ballot here in California. Uh, well, it was on my ballot. I spilled some when I was voting. All right, we got to... Now, uh, marijuana actually wasn't on the ballot here in California, despite uh, Bill Maher's joke there about spilling marijuana on the ballot. But as I talked about in my show uh, last week, we did have Proposition 47 that turned all these uh, drug crimes, uh, drug possession crimes, into misdemeanors here in California, and that passed overwhelmingly. Uh, I even pointed out in the uh, excerpt video I uploaded, uh, was it Wednesday? I think it was Wednesday. Uh, it was um, election wins show drug reform will sweep the nation, and it showed a clip from uh, Senator Rand Paul also last week. So uh, that was good news uh, on the ballot, even if it wasn't good news for Democrats in terms of the candidates that won in almost every one of the elections. Uh, but I also want to show uh, a direct response to the elections from President Obama himself. Uh, this is, he did 
an interview on CBS's Face the Nation with Bob Schieffer. Uh, this was the 60th anniversary of Face the Nation, so they had an interview both with President Barack Obama, which I took a few clips from, and with George W. Bush, which uh, I hope you all appreciate uh, that I decided not to take any clips from George W. Bush, former president. But here's uh, President Obama, and he's actually taking responsibility for the election loss, despite uh, you'll see some questions on Fox News based on uh, the idea that he won't take responsibility. And I, I didn't take a whole bunch of clips of Republicans and especially right-wing pundits claiming, oh, you know, Obama isn't listening. But here you can see Obama say that uh, he got beat and uh, he takes responsibility as head of the party in answer to a question from uh, Bob Schieffer on CBS's Face the Nation this morning over here. Foreign policy, but I also want to ask you about what happened on Tuesday. We got uh, yeah. <laughs> Harry Truman once famously said, if you want a friend in Washington, get a dog. And I thought of that when I heard the chief of staff of the Democratic leader of the Senate, Harry Reid, say, and this is his quote, the president's approval rating is basically 40 percent. What else more is there to say? He's basically saying it was your fault. Do you feel it was your fault? Well, look, uh, uh, another saying Harry Truman's was the buck stops with, with me. The buck stops right here at my desk. And so uh, whenever, as the head of the party, it doesn't do well, I've got to take responsibility for it. Um, I, the message that I took from this election, and we've seen this in a number of elections, successive elections, is people want to see this city work. And they feel as if it's not working. The economy has improved significantly. There's no doubt about it. We had a jobs report uh, for October that showed that once again, over 200,000 jobs created. We've now created more than 10 million. The unemployment rates come down faster than we could have anticipated. Just to give you some perspective, Bob, we've created more jobs in the United States than every other advanced economy combined since I came into office. And so we're making progress, but people still feel like their wages haven't gone up, their incomes haven't gone up, it's still hard to save for retirement, still hard to send a kid to college. And then they see Washington gridlocked and they're frustrated. And uh, you know, they know one person in Washington, uh, and that's the President of the United States. So I've got to make this city work better for them. All the pre hmm. So. There you saw President Obama taking responsibility, and he, he seemed to be, you know, listening to the result about, you know, his administration not working and not getting things done. And uh, now I mentioned that Fox News was talking a lot about the president not listening to the results of the election. And uh, I, like I said, I'm not going to show a bunch of clips on that, but here you can see uh, Chris Wallace, the host of Fox News Sunday, sort of use that as the premise of his question to one of the uh, senator, new senators elected to Congress, uh, the first Republican uh, or the first woman from West Virginia and the first Republican from West Virginia in, I, I can't remember, like 50 years, something like that. Uh, and her name is Shelley Moore uh, Capito, or uh, I'm not sure I have that last uh, part of her last name right. It's, uh, yeah, Shelley Moore C Capito, I think is... I'm probably mispronouncing that, but anyway, you can see how Chris Wallace kind of uh, gives her the softball question about President Obama not listening to the electorate uh, over in this clip. In his news conference the day after the election, the president was unwilling to say that he's going to change any of his policies or change the way he does business. And he also seemed to almost dismiss the message from the voters on Tuesday night. Take a look. To everyone who voted, I want you to know that I hear you. To the two-thirds of voters who chose not to participate in the process yesterday, I hear you too. Do you think the president gets it, gets how unhappy voters are with him and the Democrats? You know, not really. Uh, with those comments that we saw right after the election, when he says he hears two-thirds of the people that are not voting, I don't. I, what kind of message could he possibly be getting? I, I think the dysfunction, the gridlock, the uh, overreaching, certainly in my state, the overreaching by certain regulatory bodies is really, I think, uh, eating away at the confidence in his ability to lead and an ability to get things done. 
And I don't believe that, you know, I want to believe that we can do this. I do believe that we can and we must. And I hope the president uh, kind of gets on board a little bit more than he did in that first press conference. You know, there's also. <laughs> so uh, I don't know. I, I'm not sure that question was completely fair that Chris Wallace asked about uh, whether President Obama was listening. But you did see both President Obama in that clip from CBS's Face the Nation saying that he wants to end the gridlock and get things working. And uh, you also saw the senator-elect from West Virginia, Sheila Moore Capito, or however you pronounce her name, uh, also say that same thing about wanting to end gridlock. And that seems to be a common theme among the uh, people after the election. And I, I don't know if that's actually going to work, but uh, it's not uh, universally shared because there was this interesting clip from Senator Rand Paul. Uh, you know, he's from Kentucky and so is Mitch McConnell, the new leader of the Senate, who uh, was challenged by Allison Lund Lundegren Grimes, but uh, uh, beat her, I think, by like eight points in Kentucky. And on the night of uh, Mitch McConnell's victory, Senator Rand Paul talked about uh, not really ending gridlock, but sending bill after bill to uh, President Obama in a way that until he wearies of all these Republican bills and you can actually see um, over uh, let's see that this next clip is uh, from CNN's uh, State of the Union Candy Crowley asks uh, Senator John Thune uh, from South Dakota who uh, uh, about whether uh, this is actually going to happen that um, what Senator Rand Paul was talking about. Um, and uh, so you can see that not everyone is uh, necessarily interested in uh, ending gridlock with the introductory clip from Senator Rand Paul that uh, Candy Crowley uses to talk to Senator uh, John Thune over in this clip. Let me start with the elections and with you, Senator Thune. I Elections have consequences. You all had a terrific election. Uh, you are going to be in the majority uh, on the Senate side, already in the majority on the House side. I want to let you hear something that Senator Rand Paul, a very visible member of your Republican caucus, said on the night that Mitch McConnell won his election about what's ahead. It will be two long years till we get to replace this president. Until then, we can and we will send him legislation. Under Mitch McConnell's leadership, we will send the president bill after bill until he wearies of it. Senator Thune, is that the Republican, the plan for the Republican leadership is to just keep sending the president uh, bills? He didn't say it, but the implication was bills that he probably won't sign. Candy, the, the plan is to, to try and get the Senate opened up and working again and, and have some votes. You know, the House has sent uh, almost 400 pieces of legislation to the Senate that have been collecting dust on Senator Reid's desk, and uh, 40 of those deal with jobs in the economy, which is where we think the focus ought to be. And so I guess what I would argue is that um, we can do big things in a time of divided government. That's been true in the past. Social security reform, tax reform, welfare reform, balanced budgets. There have been lots of examples where you have uh, Democrats and Republicans, a Democrat in the White House or Republican in some cases, working with the other party in Congress to do some big things. And, and that, that would be my goal and my objective. We will can be sending legislation uh, to the president. Can you name me something big that you think you can do? Well, I'd love to see us do something in the area of tax reform. I'd love to see us do something in the area. I think initially, at least coming out of the gate, things on jobs, trade policy, uh, energy policy. Energy gives us a very competitive edge. It's very important to the economy. Senator and that's something I think that the president, I hope, would, would sign into law. We know that to get anything done, we have to get a presidential signature. But we've got to get the Senate and the House moving again and actually producing legislation that we can send Senator to the president. So it's good to see at least uh, one Republican try to repudiate what Senator Rand Paul said there about uh, sending bill after bill until President Obama wearies of them. And uh, it looks like there are at least some Republicans who don't want there to be an increase in the uh, uh, Tea Party influence on the Republican Party. And one of the uh, big uh, Tea Party uh, members in Congress uh, or from the Tea Party Caucus, uh, Michelle Bachman is actually leaving Congress and she was also over on CNN State of the Union. 
I want to show a quick clip where uh, Candy Crowley asked if uh, the Tea Party influence would be increased or decreased in uh, the upcoming Congress. And, of course, uh, Michelle Bachman said it's going to increase, although I think she uh, did like a mistaken double negative where she said uh, people don't misunderstand what the Tea Party is for when she meant to say that they do misunderstand. Uh, I'm not sure. From the context, I think she did misstate it. Uh, over in this clip. I'm going to give you the last word here because do you think there will be more Tea Party influence on John Boehner or less coming up? Well, I think we saw a lot of influence this Tuesday at the polls. It was really the energy of fiscal sanity. That's what the Tea Party is. It's malign and people don't misunderstand what it is, but it's really about bringing fiscal sanity. That was the message of Tuesday and that's a united message both in the House now and in the Senate. I got to leave it there. <laughs> Well, I don't know. I'm not going to miss Michelle Bachman, and I hope she's wrong about uh, the increased Tea Party influence. But uh, one thing is sure, there are going to be changes. And one of the things that's uh, really going to be affected, I think, by this election is uh, the government policy on climate change, which I know is of interest to a lot of my viewers. And I thought uh, Bill Maher did a really good job of contrasting the Democrats who were in charge of certain Senate committees uh, before the election and the people who are most likely to replace them in the Republican Senate and to sp specifically point out to people who say that there's no difference between Democrats and Republicans that this actually makes a huge difference uh, especially going uh, to the end uh, of this clip you'll see there's a switch between uh, Barbara Boxer and James Inhofe, but uh, I'll talk about that after you watch the whole clip over here. And for those people who say it doesn't matter who you elect, I want to show you a few quotes here. These are people who either lost or were in office or didn't win. Out is this guy from Iowa, ran against Joni Ernst. He said climate disruption is real and absolutely needs to be addressed. Joni Ernst says, I have not seen proven proof because she's an idiotic idiot. <laughs> that it is entirely mad-made. I don't know the science behind climate change. Yes, moron, but there are people who do. <laughs> I've heard arguments on both sides. Okay. <clears throat> Colorado, Mark Udall, out. He said Colorado's persistent drought, successive mega fires, and destructive floods show why Congress needs to act ASAP. The idiot who took his place, I don't think he could say yes or no. Okay, moving on. Alaska, Mark Begich, out. Urgent, he called climate change. This fuckhead said the jury is still out on climate change. No, it's not. Harry Reid, of course, out as majority leader. Harry said we should be facing the reality of climate change. Climate change is here. Mitch McConnell, of course, the king of coal, denying glo global warming is why he gets paid. He says, for everyone who thinks it's warming, I can find someone who thinks it isn't. Yes, the lobbyist you have drinks with, you chinless <laughs> fuck. And... Here's uh, Barbara Boxer was heading the committee about the environment, right? She said, man-made climate change is a planetary emergency and one of the most important challenges facing humankind. And, of course, now the guy taking over, James Inhofe, the worst. God's still up there, he says. The arrogance of people to think that we human beings would be able to change what he is doing in the climate. Oof, wow. See, I love that. He's mad. We shouldn't be mad. He's mad that we're even bringing this up because God's still up there. <clears throat> <laughs> I thought my viewers would uh, particularly enjoy uh, that fairly long clip from HBO's Real Time with Bill Maher, not just because of the climate change part, but because of the uh, theist view of climate change that we shouldn't be interfering with God's plan by worrying about climate change, that... That's like the worst of the worst of the Republican uh, beliefs on climate change. And, you know, um, later in the show, in a clip I didn't take, um, Senator Bernie Sanders was asked by Bill Maher if, you know, the people who are uh, 
the climate deniers if they actually believe that stuff like what Jim uh, Inhofe said Senator Jim Inhofe said or whether uh, they're just like cynically doing it because of their donors and he he actually said that he thought Senator Jim Inhofe is uh, a nice man and he really believes what he believes I mean of course Senator Bernie Sanders doesn't agree with any of that stuff on climate change uh, but then there are others who are just like bought out so it's like the uh, there was some great line from Bill Maher that I should have taken as a clip possibly uh, but it was like um, it, so it's a, a coalition of the um, uh, greedy cynical and the truly stupid with uh, I guess Senator Jim Hoff being the truly stupid in that equation but uh, sorry I didn't get you that clip but uh, I, I described it to you and then uh, the other issue that I guess the uh, new Republican-led Congress is going to focus on, apparently, is Obamacare, as you might expect. Uh, and I want to show one clip on that. This is um, uh, from over on uh, NBC's Meet the Press. Uh, Chuck Todd had one of the new senators on, uh, Mike Rounds. I think he's from, uh, is he from South Dakota? I think he's from South Dakota. One of the Dakotas, anyway, I think. Uh, and Chuck Todd asked him, after he was talking about uh, looking at every section of Obamacare, if, if that was going to be the big priority of the Republican Senate was appeal, uh, repealing Obamacare, which of course won't work because it has to be signed by Obama, and Obama's not going to sign a repeal of Obamacare, right? And anyway, here's uh, how Chuck Todd confronted uh, the uh, senator elect Mike Rounds on that issue over here. It's getting results means you go back in and you take apart Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act section by section. You pass the Keystone XL pipeline, get energy production started again, and get our grain back onto those rail cars that right now can't get to market because so of the, the glut of oil that's coming through on the rail lines. So dismantling health care is, is a priority. You don't think that's going to add to the dysfunction of Congress, though? I think there are bits and pieces of it you start out with section by section and you do it in such a fashion that you pick those items which have to be fixed. You, you start out, look, there's a, there's a section in it, the Independent Payment Advisory Board, which needs to be eliminated in my opinion. And I think most people out there would agree with that. The, the medical devices taxes that are there right now has to be taken apart. So I think there are pieces in there which Republicans and Democrats alike recognize have got to be fixed. But it's even more than that. It's the fact that Republicans have to set the agenda and we have to execute. We have to tell people what our overall plan is. Let's actually get a budget and let's pass a budget every single year and let's do it on time. Let's make government functional once again. That's what the American people are expecting. They want us to go in All and right. to do our jobs. And the message that I think a lot of us have is, is right. we didn't come there to sit on our butts. We came there to get the job done. <laughs> Congresswoman. <laughs> so, yeah, it sounds like there actually is some priority to repeal parts of Obamacare. And then the other clip on the Obamacare issue I want to show you real quick is uh, there was other interesting news that if there hadn't been a big election this week might have been uh, bigger news that the Supreme Court has agreed to take up this uh, new challenge to Obamacare about the funding of uh, the state uh, the uh, people who sign up for Obamacare in states where there aren't state exchanges there's sort of like this typo in the law I guess is the way at least uh, the people on uh, the pro Obamacare side uh, call it a typo anyway, where it says that uh, you can only get subsidies if you're, you know, one of the great things about Obamacare is that for people making up to uh, like 150% or uh, like well into like $40,000 a year or even above that, uh, you can get some subsidy to help pay for your health insurance. And the law says you get that when you sign up through a state exchange. Uh, but then there are more than 30 states where the states didn't set up the exchanges, so they had to use the federal exchanges, and the federal government is still giving uh, subsidies to those people, which is uh, pretty much the way the law was designed to work, except for this one clause uh, where they said that the subsidies would be given through the state exchanges, and so that's been working its way through the courts, and the Supreme Court this week said they're going to take that case, and uh, I'll talk about, it's kind of described in detail in this uh, ABC report. Um, this is um, uh, Terry Moran, that's right, their reporter Terry Moran uh, talking about, well, it is Terry Moran, right? Um, 
Yeah, Terry Moran on, on the Supreme Court taking this case. It's uh, the King versus Burwell case uh, over in this clip. From the moment President Obama signed his centerpiece legislation back in 2010. We are done. Yeah. The Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, has survived one near-death experience after another, none more dramatic than the Supreme Court's 5-4 to four decision to uphold the law in 2012. Now, Obamacare is once again in the judicial and political crosshairs. House Speaker John Boehner made that crystal clear after the Republican midterm stampede. The House, I'm sure, at some point next year, will move to repeal Obamacare because it should be repealed and it should be replaced. But that idea is likely going nowhere. President Obama, who wields a veto power that would be tough to override, said he'd fight to save his biggest achievement. Repeal of the law, <laughs> I won't sign. Efforts that would take away health care from the 10 million people who now have it uh, and the millions more who are eligible to get it, uh, we're not going to support. And now the Supreme Court will weigh in again, this time drilling deep into the dense detail of the law where opponents say there is a fatal flaw. Those subsidies to help millions of Americans buy insurance, opponents say the law clearly states they must come through state insurance exchanges. But dozens of states refused to set up those exchanges, so the Obama administration provided the subsidies on the federal insurance exchange, too. And that, opponents say, is illegal. But supporters, including the law's authors, they say Congress always intended that subsidies should be available to every American who qualifies for them. The stakes couldn't be higher. Millions of Americans would lose health care and Obamacare itself collapse if the court rules against the administration. So the fate of this law and of President Obama's legacy could once again come down to a single vote on the Supreme Court. Chief Justice John Roberts. For this week, Terry... Hmm. So yeah, that was Terry Moran's report on ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos uh, this morning. And it sounds like it... Uh, will come down to the vote of Chief Justice John Roberts. And I don't know, after trying to make the court look nonpartisan before to actually have the Supreme Court take the guts out of Obamacare, get rid of the subsidies to people, uh, you know, the low and middle income people get subsidies to help them buy health care. That's a real big part of Obamacare. And if the court decides to strike that down because of what's basically a typo, uh, that seems like a kind of partisan Republican decision from what's a pretty partisan Republican court that I thought uh, Chief Justice John Roberts was trying to uh, change the image of the court, which makes me think that maybe there will be five votes to not gut Obamacare in this uh, King versus Burwell case, but uh, that that's something we should know by like June or July, I guess. Uh, anyway, uh, you would think that Obamacare might be the first place that the new Republican Congress and President Obama would find a way to conflict because that's the, you know, the thing that Republicans obsess about. But actually, it sounds like what might be the first point of conflict is whether President Obama grants uh, deferred action to undocumented immigrants. You know, I, I, if you've been watching my show I guess this is my 81st week in a row, pretty much, with a couple weeks off uh, over the last almost two years now. Um, I've covered comprehensive immigration reform and the way it passed with like 68 votes in the U.S. Senate and then died in the House of Representatives. And uh, President Obama promised actually to do some sort of executive action to stop the deportation of people who have families here and, you know, are part of our communities and... Uh, so he was going to do it uh, many months ago and then promised to do it after the election to, you know, help those uh, Democratic senators who didn't win anyway. And it was a big mistake, I think. And it looks like it's going to be a, a big point of contention. And uh, I'll discuss that after I show you the uh, ABC report from their uh, reporter, Jonathan Carl, on This Week with George Stephanopoulos this morning. Uh, talking about how it's a rocky start for the Obama administration on immigration over in this clip. already broken bread with congressional leaders, but he is off to a rocky start with the Republicans. It was a lunch that brought no real breakthroughs and apparently no smiles either. 
President acknowledged the message from Tuesday night's drubbing of Democrats was loud and clear. The American people just want to see work done here in Washington. They'd like to see more cooperation. Uh, and I think all of us uh, have the responsibility, me in particular, to try to make that happen. But despite the election wave that swept Republicans into control of the Senate, it's time for a new way forward. President Obama insists he'll still take executive action on immigration reform before the end of the year in defiance of Republicans in Congress. If they want to get a bill done, uh, whether it's during the lame duck or next year, I'm eager to see what they have to offer. But what I'm not going to do is just wait. And the White House says there's no backing down on that. Even before he's had a chance to sit down to talk to him about it, he is completely closed to the idea of delaying this executive action. Well, not um, even willing to talk to them he's about gonna, delaying. He's going to take that executive action before the end of the year. But Republican leaders warned if the president goes around Congress on immigration, it will poison the well on virtually well, everything. When you play with matches, uh, you take the risk of burning yourself. And he's going to burn himself. Uh, if he continues to go down this path. It's like waving a red flag in front of a bull to say, if you guys don't do what I want, I'm going to do it on my own. So what issues show the biggest chances for actual agreement? There are bipartisan calls for action on trade, corporate tax reform, infrastructure spending, and the Keystone Pipeline. And despite their track record, President Obama and Republicans showed some signs they may be ready to turn the page. Just because you have divided government, it doesn't mean you don't accomplish anything. I would enjoy having some uh, Kentucky bourbon uh, with Mitch McConnell. So I think we can have a productive relationship. For Democrats Tuesday... I noticed Jonathan Carl there on ABC's This Week and the uh, list of things he had that uh, there had been called for bi bipartisan work on. He, he didn't mention uh, criminal justice reform and drug law reform even though if you watched my show last week, I had a, a good clip from Senator Rand Paul actually calling for bipartisan work on that. So I don't know why everything Jonathan Carl listed there, I think if you go back and look uh, at that last clip, they were all like corporate stuff, things that help corporations, which uh, I guess that is kind of the place where the Democrats and Republicans can find common ground to work on things in the upcoming Congress. But uh, you heard that uh, Republicans have threatened that uh, it's going to poison the well and be a red flag and all this stuff if President Obama fulfills his promise of finally deferring action on uh, the undocumented immigrants and letting people, you know, who are, you know, law otherwise law-abiding and living here with families, you know, basically the millions of people who would get deferred action are people who are parents of U.S. citizens or otherwise family members of U.S. citizens and uh, people who you know don't have criminal records and there are millions of people like that and they're uh, I think in a clip I'm not going to show uh, that one person pointed out that like a thousand people are getting deported every day in the United States and uh, <clears throat> I was glad to see that when uh, President Obama did his interview with Bob Schieffer over on CBS's Face the Nation he did not back down he is gonna take this action before the end of the year according to his answer despite you know the threats from Republicans uh, he you know has a good rationale of uh, how if you know they want to uh, react to his action then all they have to do is pass legislation that solves the problem and and it will totally nullify what he does and you know, anyway you can see President Obama explain it uh, over in this clip Talk about immigration you have said you're gonna change immigration policy with an executive order by the end of the year Republicans said don't do it. Mitch McConnell, it's like waving a red flag in front of a bull. John Boehner, when you play with matches, you take the risk of burning yourself. Why not give them a chance to see what they can do on that and then take the executive order? Number one, everybody agrees the immigration system is broken. And we've been talking about it for years now in terms of fixing it. We need to be able to secure our border. We need to make an legal immigration system that is more efficient and we need to make sure that uh, the millions of people who are here, many who have been here for a decade or more uh, and have American kids and for all practical purposes are part of our community, that they pay a fine, they pay any penalties, they learn English, they get to the back of the line, but they have a capacity to legalize themselves here because we're not, we don't have the capacity to deport 11 million people. Everybody agrees on that. I 
presided over a, a process in which the Senate produced a bipartisan bill. I then said to John Boehner, uh, John, let's get this passed through the House. For a year, I stood back and let him work on this. He decided not to call the Senate bill, and he couldn't produce his own bill. And I told him at the time, John, if, if you don't do it, I've got legal authority to make improvements on the system. I'd prefer and still prefer to see it done through Congress, but every day that I wait, we're misallocating resources, we're deporting people that shouldn't be deported, we're not deporting folks that are dangerous and need to be deported. So John, I'm, I'm going to give you some time, but if you can't get it done before the end of the year, I'm going to have to take the steps that I can to improve the system. So are you saying here today their time has run out? What I'm saying to them, actually their time hasn't run out. I'm going to do what I can do through executive action. It's not going to be everything that needs to get done. And it will take time to put that in place. And in the interim, the minute they pass a bill that addresses the problems with immigration reform, I will sign it and it supersedes whatever actions I take. And I'm encouraging them to do so. On parallel track, we're going to be implementing an executive action. But if, in fact, a bill gets passed, Nobody's going to be happier than me to sign it because that means it will be permanent rather than temporary. So they have the ability, the authority, the control to supersede anything I do through my executive authority by simply carrying out their functions over there. And, and if in fact it's true that they want to pass a bill, they've got good ideas, nobody's stopping them and the minute they do it and the minute I sign that bill, then what I've done goes away. So I hope that's true. I hope President Obama takes executive action. You know, like I said, I've been working on this issue locally uh, in California. We passed the Trust Act that says that uh, when undocumented immigrants come in contact with local law enforcement, if they don't have serious crimes on their record, they can't be turned over to immigration authorities. And that's really important because we have so many uh, undocumented immigrants living in our communities. We don't want them to fear contact with the local police or that makes us all less safe because victims of crime and uh, even witnesses to crime won't talk to the police and uh, that leaves dangerous people on the street when uh, these undocumented immigrants there they have families they live in our communities and I've seen really sad stories of people getting deported for you know nothing uh, even, even in my local area here so I hope what President Obama said is true and he actually does go ahead with this though I want to show over on uh, uh, this is from Fox News Sunday they had on Republican Senator John Barrasso and he was still being really threatening saying that if President Obama does it it's uh, kinda of like throwing a hand grenade into the Republican Senate I guess uh, or well you can see what he said over in this clip Vietnam. Okay, let's talk about the lunch, which you both attended on Friday. Uh, Senator Barrasso, how heated was the discussion about the president taking executive action to defer deportations of millions of people in this country illegally? And will that really, as some Republican leaders are suggesting, hurt cooperation on every issue? Well, I believe it uh, will hurt cooperation on every issue, Chris. The, what the president does over the next two months is really going to set the tone for the next two years uh, in Washington. You know, n nobody ran for office and won a Senate race based on the president having more executive authority to take uh, executive actions on amnesty or on uh, health care or any other of those issues. The American people want us to work together to find solutions. So I think it'd be like the president pulling the pin out of the hand grenade and throwing it in as we're trying to actually work together. I'm hoping that cooler heads at the White House can prevail upon the president to say, look, if you want to have a good constructive final two years of your presidency, don't do this now. Wait until the new Congress is sworn in. Let them come together and do the sort of things that uh, Senator-elect Gardner was talking about in terms of wor working together to find some solutions on immigration. <laughs> now, of course, that's Senator John Barrasso, from, a Republican from Wyoming. I don't know how much he has to worry about the Latino vote, but uh, he talked about the senator-elect from Colorado, Cory Gardner, who was on a couple different shows, and he was not as harsh at all uh, when it came to whether President Obama should be punished for 
taking this executive action. He, he did say he wanted uh, President Obama to work with the Congress, but he, he didn't say, you know, these incendiary things like throw a grenade or even that there would be any uh, kind of retribution from the Republican Senate, uh, because I think he has to worry about the Latino vote a lot more. Uh, and I want to show uh, first, this is a little more ambiguous answer uh, from uh Senator-elect Cory Gardner from Colorado, he was on ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos, and uh, George Stephanopoulos asked him about this issue uh, over in this clip. And we saw the president, there's, we know there's going to be a showdown coming on immigration as well. The president reiterating that he's prepared to go it alone to provide more protections for undocumented immigrants now in the country. What does that mean for cooperation, and how will Republicans in the Senate and the House respond? You know, I hope that the immigration reform effort by the House and the Senate will gain speed and momentum. I've supported immigration reform and believe we need to go there. But the, the question is this, will the president do the right thing? And I think the president will do the right thing when it comes to immigration reform, and that is working with the House and the Senate instead of going around the House and the so Senate. So you don't believe it when he says he's going to issue that executive order? Well, again, I hope the president does the right thing. Now, the president, I haven't seen the executive order. I don't know what it's going to do, but I hope the president and encourage the president to do the right thing, and that is to work with the House and the Senate on a solution. Because whatever the executive order is, if he does indeed do that, will not be the kind of changes and reforms that we need to the overall immigration system. So let's do the right thing. Let's work together. Finally. So I thought that was kind of interesting that the senator-elect from Colorado, Republican Cory Gardner, uh, wouldn't like say nasty things about it poisoning the well or throwing a grenade if uh, President Obama uh, does this executive order, although he does want to work with Obama afterwards to supersede the executive order, which is kind of the same thing you saw President Obama say. And uh, it, some people say that what if President Obama does do this executive order uh, deferring deportation for millions of undocumented immigrants, He's kind of setting a trap for the Republicans for them to overreact in the other direction and cast themselves as anti-Latino or, I guess, anti-Hispanic is the way that uh, Chris Wallace phrased it over in his question. Also to Senator-elect Cory Gardner, like I said, he was on a couple shows, uh, and I often disagree with the premises of the questions on uh, Fox News Sunday, but this one I think he may actually be right that it's kind of a trap that they're setting up for the Republicans and You'll see Cory Gardner again won't uh, say that he's going to punish Obama for taking the executive action uh, over in this clip. In your campaign, you reached out to Hispanics who make up 14 percent of the voters in your state of Colorado. And you did very well in a lot of the areas of Colorado where they live uh, since the election. Perhaps the biggest issue has been the, the president's statement, his determination that he is going to sign this executive order deferring the deportation of millions of people who are in this country illegally now. Here is some of the debate over that issue. What I'm not going to do is just wait. Uh, I, I think it's fair to say that I've uh, shown a lot of patience. I believe that the president continues to act on his own. He is going to poison the will. When you play with matches, uh, you take the risk of burning yourself. Senator-elect, do you worry that Republicans are going to once again be seen, when all of this is over, once again be seen as anti-Hispanic and anti-immigration? Well, I think what we have to do is make sure that we work with the president, show a willingness in the House and the Senate to work together so that the president can ultimately do the right thing. The right thing for the president to do isn't going around Congress, but it's working with Congress. And so I think that's the challenge that this new era of goodwill, so to speak, uh, presents itself to, for us. We have to make sure that the president is willing to uh, do the right thing, and that means that Congress, the House, the House, the Senate, are willing to show an effort to, to work together. I think ultimately that's how we have immigration reform, and we have to continue our outreach efforts uh, in every community in our country, in every community in states like Colorado, to make sure that they have the confidence that we're going to look out for them and be a strong voice for them, regardless of where they are from. But what's going to happen when the president, and he says he's going to do it sometime before the end of the year, signs this executive order, goes around Congress? 
Well, I hope the president between now and whenever that is will change his mind, will decide to do the right thing. And if he uh, does That means uh, Mitch McConnell, Leader Boehner. Again, we have to encourage him to do the right thing. I don't want to speculate about an executive order that may or may not exist, but the bottom line is this. We know we need immigration reform in this country because the system isn't working at what we have right now. But the president, to encourage working together, to encourage a way to go forward, if he does this, then I'm, I'm concerned that he won't be doing the right thing, and that would hurt our ability to move forward the next two years. Let's do the right thing. Let's work together. Let's find solutions. That's what the people of Colorado are looking for. In large part, that's why we were able to achieve victory, because we presented that positive, optimistic vision for this country, and that's what the president needs to do. Well, so you can see Senator-elect Cory Gardner from Colorado, the new Republican in the Senate, uh, is... Uh, not going to say that he will punish Obama or say anything negative about Obama for taking this executive action. If he takes it, he, he won't go as far as uh, those other, you know, as with John Boehner and Mitch McConnell and even what I showed from uh, Senator John Barrasso. Uh, so that uh, makes me a little bit hopeful that uh, there won't be a Republican overreaction. But then when it comes to the actual substance, even uh, Cory Gardner there, who was one of the more reasonable people because he actually uh, is worried about getting Latino votes in Colorado. You'll notice when he lists what should be in comprehensive immigration reform, he talks about a, a guest worker program, but nothing about a, he never says path to citizenship or, you know, bringing out of the shadows the millions of undocumented immigrants who were uh, currently unable to, you know, be first-class citizens or, you know, even have legal sta status. He, he doesn't say anything about that uh, in this uh, last Cory Gardner clip from Fox News Sunday this morning here. Cool system. But, but that's sir, the kind of message on that we have to send around the state. Uh, specifically on immigration, aren't Republicans going to have to do something when it comes to legalization of the millions who are already here? Well, I think when it comes to immigration, we've talked about border security. Let's start with border security, as so many people are asking for. But border security in and of itself is not complete unless you have a meaningful guest worker program to go along with it, to create that way for a legal avenue of labor. We have to make sure that we're fixing the entry-exit systems, making sure we're addressing E-Verify systems. Those are things that Republicans can and should do right now. That, I think, is something that the House, the Senate, and the President can work together. So let's do the right thing. Let's take those steps where I think there is a, a broad agreement that we can get behind and make sure that we are doing the right thing. So, yeah, you can see in the list of things that can get done that uh, the uh, senator-elect from Colorado, Cory Gardner, was listing there, uh, there was no path to citizenship, which is, of course, the most important part of comprehensive immigration reform. That's why... Obama has to take this executive action to give some sort of uh, certainty to people who have been here for many, many years and have families and, uh, you know, they shouldn't have to be looking over their shoulders all the time. It's a really nasty situation and I, I'm really sad that politics has gotten in the way. Um, and uh, the, I want to show a last couple clips on that from Democrats who, uh, you know, recognize the real human harm that's uh, coming from the lack of immigration reform. First one here is uh, from uh, California Congressperson Javier Becerra, uh, and he was also, at least uh, to give Fox News uh, Sunday's Chris Wallace's due, uh, he was a guest on Fox News Sunday, so they at least had someone giving that position over in this clip. Congressman, a couple of questions for you. Did the president really cut off Vice President Biden, when he started talking about this, the idea of how long would it take Republicans to come up with their own bill, and do you worry that it's going to be the grenade scenario and that this is going to poison the well on a bunch of issues, not just immigration? Well, first, I, I don't recall anybody being cut off. I, there was a good conversation back and forth. Uh, and on the issue of immigration and where we'll go, I think the president's been very patient. He made it very clear quite some time ago. He's been waiting for six years to get a bill from Congress. He's been waiting a year and a half for the House Republicans to act on the bill that the Senate passed on a bipartisan basis. And the president for months has been saying he's going to take uh, action where he can to try to make the law work better, smarter than what it is right now. And so uh, I don't think there's anything strange going on here except for the fact that if House Republicans continue to insist that the president must wait 
to help fix what everyone agrees is a broken immigration system. The only thing that uh, is harmed is our security, our economy, and all those families that are waiting to see some results. So I, I think the president is right to move forward to do what Bre President Reagan, President Bush Sr., President Bush Jr., uh, President Clinton, all presidents have used executive orders to try to make the laws work better. He cannot change the law. He can only try to make it work better and smarter. Senator Brown. Hmm. So at least Fox News Sunday did have someone with a more reasonable uh, point of view on what the president should do for the undocumented immigrants. And uh, for an even uh, more passionate view, I wanted to show this uh, new member of Congress, a, a new Democrat, I think, yeah, newly elected from uh, Arizona. That, that was one of the bright spots. Uh, and I'm going to show something about uh, Arizona being a bright spot a, a little later in the show when I, I talk about uh, actually the, the presidential election in 2016 and where the battleground states may be. But this is a, a Democrat from Arizona, Ruben Gallego, talking about the real cost of inaction on immigration uh, to you know real families and uh, how it's really hurting people. This is the final clip on immigration for the show tonight over here. Well, as somebody who represents the Latino area, and then obviously you can do the other Latino side of this, but uh, somebody who represents the Latino area, we are very ardent in that we want this executive order to come down. We're very frustrated that a good bill that came out of the Republican, I'm sorry, the Republican and Democratic bipartisan effort, uh, Congress Immigration Reform, has not moved. It's been sitting on Speaker Boehner's desk. Uh, and, you know, in the meantime, there's a lot of our families are getting deported. So, in the, as I've said even before uh, winning this seat, we do think there should be executive action. We do think there should be administrative relief for our families. At least that is what I'm hearing from my Latino uh, families in Arizona. Imagine it might be. And I've heard that from a, a lot of families in uh, my local area. I work with a lot of uh, immigrants' rights groups, and uh, it, you know, I uh, have seen the real harm it does to families when the the main breadwinner for the family gets picked up for littering or whatever or you know I, I've even heard that in uh, the Sacramento area the California Highway Patrol uh, hangs out around like these Mexican restaurants and pulls people over for like sometimes even bogus DUIs that I mean that's kind of the rumor I've heard I don't know what's behind that but it's just like really nasty that people can uh, come in contact with local law enforcement who have been here for you know a decade or more and have families and are parents of uh, citizen children, U.S. citizen children, it, and it ter you know it makes those it, uh, kids potentially homeless and uh, can mess up. Uh, you know I can, there's a specific local case. Uh, maybe I'll put a link down in the video description if you're watching. This is a recorded show. Uh, a family that uh, has been like torn apart right here in Sacramento where I live. So. It's a really nasty situation, and I hope something uh, that Obama's executive action really helps people, and Congress supersedes it with something that's more permanent. So, just like what came out of the Senate wasn't the you know greatest bill, but uh, at least it had some relief in there. So, anyway, that 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 was the final clip on immigration. I, I want to show several clips now on uh, the continuing U.S. campaign against the Islamic State, ISIS, ISIL, you know, whatever. It, Obama, you'll see who calls it ISIL, the uh, Islamic State in uh, Iraq and the Levant. Uh, first, I want to show a news clip from Martha Raddatz on ABC. I mentioned over you know several shows that Martha Raddatz has some of the best uh, sources in the Pentagon. She's a uh, been to uh, was a reporter in Iraq for a while, and uh, I've been showing clips of her going back to like 2006 at least uh, when I started my YouTube channel um, on Bush's strategy in Iraq. And anyway, I, I think her title now for ABC is uh, their global affairs correspondent, something like that. And so here she's talking about the uh, new troops that President Obama has ordered into Iraq. 1,500 new troops uh, doubling down is what they call it. And, uh, just, and she gives sort of a general description of what's been going on in that conflict uh, over in this clip. Doubling down against ISIS in Iraq. First, it was 300 troops on the ground to protect diplomats, growing to almost 1,600 to train and advise, now up to 3,100 approved, not to mention hundreds of airstrikes, including these on the besieged town of Kobani this weekend. 
So what will these troops do? Outside Erbil and Baghdad, two expeditionary operation centers will be built to advise and assist Iraqi and Kurdish forces. And at least four additional training sites will be set up in the volatile north, south, and Al Anbar province in the west. The White House insists these are not combat troops, but that is some hot territory. ISIS strongholds. No question, they'll be in more danger. And Americans in Iraq will get, quote, an appropriate array of force protection capabilities, which will likely mean attack helicopters. Matt Bradley has been reporting on the ground in Iraq for 18 months. We spoke to him on Skype from Baghdad. Most Iraqis know that the Obama administration is going to stick to the commitment that it's made to not deploy these troops into a wartime scenario. But they do see this as one more step towards the inevitable. There has to be U.S. troops on the ground because the Iraqi military is, is simply incapable of fighting the Islamic State. And this week, President Obama is saying he'll ask for even more support from Congress. I'm going to begin engaging Congress over a new authorization to use military force against ISIL. And when one of the most powerful voices in the newly elected Republican Senate says things like this. We need to understand that the president is the commander in chief and that role, I do not believe, should be impinged upon by the Congress. The president just might get his wish. For this week, Martha Raddatz, ABC. So, yeah, uh, you can see from the end of that clip of Martha Raddatz's report that uh, in addition to sending these additional 1,500 troops into Iraq, it sounds like President Obama may go to the Congress to get authorization, uh, even from the, the lame duck Congress before the new Congress comes in in January. Uh, I don't know, maybe he'll do the immigration thing and then switch it around and get uh, congressional authorization with Republican support on... Uh, U.S. troops in Iraq, and he's trying to get a new authorization that um, that would supersede the the ones he's using from uh, 2002 and 2003, uh, the authorization for for use of force in Afghanistan, and then Bush's authorization in Iraq. Uh, and I, actually, I want to show a few clips of President Obama talking about. Uh, use of force in Iraq that, that, from his interview with Bob Schieffer on Face the Nation this morning, uh, first uh, about doubling the forces there and then about the effect on U.S. policy with Iran and then there's this third clip about U.S. policy towards Syria and Bashar al-Assad, uh, but here's the first clip on doubling down and uh, President Obama's fairly long explanation of why he's sending in more troops over on Face the Nation this morning here. I want to start with uh, your decision to basically double the size of the American force in Iraq, to bring it up to about 3,000. Uh, when you ordered the airstrikes three months ago, you didn't seem to think that was going to be necessary. Uh, what, is, what is this signal, that uh, what we've done so far hasn't worked? No, actually, what it signals is a new phase. Um, First of all, let's be clear. ISIL is a threat not only to Iraq, but also the region, and ultimately, over the long term, could be a threat to the United States. Uh, this is a, an extreme group of the sort we haven't seen before, but it also combines terrorist tactics with on-the-ground capabilities, uh, in part because they incorporated a lot of Saddam Hussein's old uh, military commanders. And, you know, this is a threat that we are are committed not only to degrade but ultimately destroy. It's going to take some time. What we knew was that phase one was getting an Iraqi government that was inclusive and credible and we now have done that. Uh, and so now what we've done is rather than just try to halt ISIL's momentum, we're now in a position to start going on some offense. The airstrikes have been very effective in degrading ISIL's capabilities and slowing the advance that they were making. Now what we need is ground troops, Iraqi ground troops, that can start pushing them back. Will these Americans be going into battle with them? No. Uh, the, uh, so what hasn't changed is our troops are not engaged in combat. Essentially what we're doing is we're taking four training centers with coalition members that allow us to bring in Iraqi recruits, some of the Sunni tribes that are still resisting ISIL, 
giving them proper training, proper equipment, helping them with strategy, helping them with logistics, we will provide them close air support once they are prepared to start going on the offense against ISIL. But what we will not be doing is having our troops do the fighting. What we learned from the previous engagement in Iraq is that our military is always the best. We can always knock out, knock back any threat. But then when we leave, that threat comes back. Should we expect that? So I thought that was an interesting answer from uh, President Obama, and I'm going to show uh, Senator uh, Chris Murphy kind of echo what President Obama said there about the need for a political se settlement, um, not just a military uh, use of force by the United States. Uh, but before I get to those clips, uh, uh, from and then there'll be some Republicans who d disagree and agree and. Uh, but first I want to show, like I said, two more clips from that interview with President Obama. First, where he talks about uh, the uh, effects on U.S. policy with Iran. I guess uh, President Obama sent this uh, secret letter to the supreme leader of Iran, the, the religious leader, what's his name, Ayatollah uh, Khamenei, or Khamenei, it's not Khomeini, it's uh, Khamenei, or I can never know how to pronounce it, but... Uh, Bob Schieffer asked President Obama about that in his interview on uh, CBS's Face the Nation, and he got this long answer that talked about uh, U.S. nuclear talks with Iran that are supposed to be up, uh, I think it's November 24th, they're supposed to reach some agreement, and he also talked about uh, common interests with Iran, uh, fighting uh, ISIS, um, but then also why we can't be true allies, uh, and I'll talk about all of those a little more after I show you that clip here. You sent a secret letter to Iran's supreme commander, or supreme leader, last month about our two countries' shared interest in fighting ISIS. I guess I'd ask you the first question, has he answered? I tend not to comment on uh, any communications that I have with various leaders. Uh, I, I'm, I've got a whole bunch of channels where uh, we're communicating uh, to various leaders around the world. Let me speak more broadly about the policies vis-a-vis uh, -vis Iran. We have two big interests in Iran that are short-term and then we've got a long-term interest. Our number one priority with respect to Iran is making sure they don't get a nuclear weapon. And because of the unprecedented sanctions that this administration put forward and mobilized the world to abide by, they got squeezed, their economy tanked, and they came to the table in a serious way for the first time uh, in a very, very long time. We've now had uh, significant negotiations. They have abided by freezing their program and, in fact, reducing their stockpile of nuclear-grade material or, or weapons-grade nuclear material. And the question now is, are we going to be able to close this final gap so that they can re-enter the international community, sanctions can be slowly uh, reduced, and we have verifiable, Loctite uh, assurances that they can't develop a nuclear weapon. There's still a big gap. We may, may not be able to get there. The second thing that we have an interest in is that Iran has influence over Shia, both in Syria and in Iraq, and we do have a shared enemy in ISIL. But I've been very clear publicly and privately we are not connecting in any way the nuclear negotiations from the issue of ISIL. We're not coordinating with Iran on ISIL. There is some deconflicting in the sense that since they have some troops or militias they control in and around Baghdad, yeah, we let them know, don't mess with us. We're not here to mess with you. We're focused uh, on our common enemy. Whoa. But there's no coordination or common battle plan, uh, and there will not be, because, and this brings me to the third issue, we still have big differences with Iran's behavior vis-a-vis -vis our allies. Uh, them uh, you know, uh, poking and prodding at, uh, and, and, and uh, creating unrest and sponsoring terrorism in the region, around the world, their anti-Israeli rhetoric and behavior. So. That's a whole other set of issues, which prevents us from ever being it, true allies. Is but it hmm. 
So yeah, I thought that was a really interesting explanation of Obama's plans for U.S. policy with Iran, not just in terms of the fight against ISIS, but also the nuclear program and also the long-term conflicts we have with the leadership in Iran. And the other answer from that same interview on a show, uh, uh, I think it is actually the next question Bob Schieffer asked, uh, had to do with U.S. policy towards Syria, whether we're still trying to get rid of Bashar al-Assad uh, and because we're doing all these airstrikes against uh, ISIS in Syria. And uh, it's kind of interesting, We, we're, even though we have military action in Syria, we our policy to get rid of uh, Bashar al-Assad, the president of Syria, is a non-military policy, as you can see, and I'll talk about that a little more after this last clip from that Bob Schieffer interview of uh, President Obama over in this clip. True allies, is but... Is it still our policy that we want President Assad of Syria to go? It is still our policy, and it's an almost absolute certainty that uh, he has lost legitimacy with such a large portion of the country by dropping barrel bombs and killing children and destroying uh, villages that were defenseless, that he can't regain the kind of legitimacy that would stitch that country back together again. Now, obviously, our priority is to go after ISIL. And so what we have said is that we are not engaging in a military action against the Syrian regime. We are going after ISIL facilities and personnel who are using Syria as a safe haven in service of our strategy in Iraq. We do want to see a political settlement inside of Syria. That's a long-term proposition. We can't solve that militarily, nor are we trying to. Let me hear. Hmm. So yeah, that's, like I was saying, President Obama is taking military or using military force in Syria, but it's only to fight ISIS. There isn't a military solution to the problem of President Bashar al-Assad in Syria, at least according to that interview, which I thought was an interesting dichotomy in U.S. foreign policy in the same country. You can let me know what you think about that. Um, and like I said, I also want to show um, a couple clips from a Democrat, uh, the a Democratic senator from Connecticut, uh, Chris Murphy, who was on CNN State of the Union and talked about how uh, there may be sort of a uh, skeptical, more uh, dovish wing of the Democrats uh, when it comes to this authorization for use of force. Uh, and kind of like I said uh, before, when I showed that clip of President Obama's answer to Bob Schieffer, uh, where I said that Chris Murphy would be echoing the part about the need for a political solution, not a military solution. And I think actually Chris Murphy made that point a lot more strongly on CNN's State of the Union in two answers. Here's the first one uh, talking to Candy Crowley uh, in this clip. Well, I think what we know is that ultimately your military operation there is only necessary insofar as it's giving you the ability to achieve some political reconciliation on the ground. Uh, and my worry is, is that we are not seeing the kind of progress that we'd like from the Iraqis when it comes to actually creating the political preconditions upon which uh, Sunni populations inside Iraq are going to choose to move away from ISIL uh, and back towards the Baghdad government. Uh, and so these 15 hundred troops are ultimately just going to be a temporary band-aid if there isn't a fully inclusive government inside Baghdad. What's maybe more important is that uh, tomorrow, I would argue, the 60-day War Powers Act clock expires. Tomorrow mm -hmm. is 60 days since the president announced his initial strategy. Congress has a constitutional responsibility to authorize this. I do not think the president has the ability under current authority to authorize 1,500 troops without Congress acting. So my hope is that when we get back, we're going to have a full debate on this. And I think a lot of us are going to be very reluctant to support this kind of infusion of ground troops absent some suggestion, some evidence that the Iraqis are doing what is necessary uh, politically to complement this major infusion of American military resources. So I'm glad that there are Democrats who are skeptical from the right direction of this use of force and the, you know, the need to put limits on it and not authorize it if there's 
not a plan for it to have some use beyond all the time we already put in uh, a lot of it, it in seeming futility in the same region and and you can see Senator Chris Murphy makes that exact point even more strongly in the second answer he gave to uh, Candy Crowley on CNN State of the Union this morning over here. Well, I, I think we have to recognize the facts, which are that we had hundreds of thousands of troops inside Iraq over the course of a decade trying to train the Iraqi armed forces. They got overrun in a period of weeks by a relatively unorganized force in ISIL. And so the idea that we are going to be able to complete with a couple hundred troops, what we are unable to do with several hundred thousand troops, um, I think strains credibility. I want to make sure that this is a realistic mission. And I do worry about mission creep. Uh, I do worry about the fact that 1,500 could become 3,000, could become 5,000. And what we know is that the massive deployment of American military forces inside the Middle East is not the solution. Um, in fact, over the course of 10 years, it made the situation worse, not better. Now, if there is evidence that the, the Iraqis are really willing to share oil revenues with the Sunnis, to partner militarily with them, to push the Shiite militias off to the side, to mm -hmm. allow the professional Iraqi military to do the fighting, then I think that I can support uh, an authorization. But absent that political progress inside Iraq, then we are just a temporary solution. Uh, and I'm just not sure that the experience that we have over the last 10 years tells us that this kind of big deployment of U.S. forces on the ground is going to work. So, hmm. so again, I thought that was a fairly reasonable argument that uh, it doesn't make sense to put more U.S. forces in after 10 years of it not working. And uh, I wanted to show some skepticism, though, uh, also about... Uh, this Sunni Shia divide and about the, the effectiveness of Iraqi forces from the Republican side. This is from uh, Congressman Daryl Issa, California uh, Congressman, uh, speaking on uh, This Week with George Stephanopoulos, talking to George Stephanopoulos this morning, also about this new deployment of troops over in this clip. I am, George. I was just in both Baghdad and Erbil, in addition to six other nations in the Middle East uh, between August and Erbil just a few weeks ago. Uh, the fact is, we're already there. We've had to be there. Uh, the government in Baghdad is still quite delusional, if you will, about uh, what the real impact is. They're still talking about long-term training before they're ready to fight. So the fact is that uh, if we're to protect the gains we made against Islamic extremism, uh, my Marines from Camp Pendleton and others are going to have to go back again. They're going to go back. Should they be in a combat position? Iraqis should b fight for their country. There's no question at all. They've been trained and they should do it. The fact is the Kurds are willing to do it. I have no doubt whatsoever that the Kurds will fight and all they need is our air support and our technical know-how and they will do it. When it comes to the Sunni-Shia divide uh, that the Maliki government created, it makes it very, very hard to put together the kind of military units that they should have. Uh, that remains to be seen of whether or not the substantial portion of that 800,000 people we trained are willing to fight. The fact is, uh, by the time they started fleeing, we were down to a quarter of a million. And when I met with the government, they said, well, we have about 8,000 who will fight. I think they have to do better. Let me so that was kind of weird that uh, uh, Congressman Daryl Issa at the end there said that he just came back from Iraq and the Iraqi army is down to 8,000 troops. That's uh, weird that it came down that far from the numbers he was saying before, like a quarter million and 800,000 at one point, supposedly. So uh, I don't know what that's all about, but uh, I also want to show uh, this next clip uh next three clips come from fox news sunday where uh, i wanted to at least show that chris wallace also brought up the issue of the need for congressional authorization for this use of force and then i'm going to show republican senator john barrasso's response to that uh, and all the need for congressional authorization over in this clip the white house lunch i want to ask you about the president's decision on Friday to send 1,500 more U.S. troops to Iraq, almost doubling our deployment there. Uh, Senator Barrasso, you're on the Foreign Relations Committee. A couple of questions. One, are you going to vote for the $5.6 billion in extra money the president wants? And secondly, 
How do you feel about this slow motion, bit by bit escalation of our footprint in Iraq? Yeah, we're going to look at specifically how he wants the money spent, but it's right that the president does come to Congress for an authorization of the use of military force. I support that. I think Congress ought to be involved in those discussions. You do get concerned about a mission creep. I think they've been doing a good job in terms of trying to degrade, but they have a long way to go in terms of destroying uh, ISIS and trying to secure uh, Iraq. There are still big problems in Syria, and we just discussed uh, all of this with, uh, with General Austin on Friday at the White House, the as well as the Secretary of Defense. Senate Senate. Congressman. <laughs> and uh, so that was the question Chris Wallace asked the Republican about whether Republicans should you know, exert their authority through Congress and uh, authorize force rather than the president taking action without any declaration from the Congress. And when he talked to the Democrat, uh, Javier Becerra, he actually mentioned Vietnam. I think the, the phrase was something like the scent of Vietnam. He asked, does this like escalation of troops in Iraq have the scent of Vietnam to Javier Becerra? I think that's the phrase he used over in this clip. Secretary of Defense. Congressman Becerra, any concerns that this escalation has the scent of Vietnam about it? And do you think the president has a strategy, a strategy and a plan to beat ISIS? The way it was outlined at the lunch on Friday, uh, it seemed like a pretty coherent plan that was directed at the ultimate goal of dismantling ISIL. And my sense is this, after, as Senator, the Senator said, we have an opportunity to look closely at all the details. I think most members are going to see that this is just a buildup of the original plan, which is to try to help the Iraqis stand up and take care of business. But where does home. it end? We're talking about it was, you know, it was in the 200, now it's 2,900. How many more well, U.S. troops? I think the president has always said that the Iraqis have to handle this. We're going to help them. They've asked for the help. We're willing to help, but it's their job to take care of their civil war. And so I don't think the president uh, intends to have this become anything close to uh, a Vietnam. Okay. <laughs> so there you have uh, the Vietnam question asked and answered on Fox News Sunday from uh, California Congressperson Javier Becerra. Uh, the last clip I want to show on the whole ISIS uh, issue also is from Fox News Sunday. I don't know if this will develop into something during the week or if this is just one of those uh, rumors that turns out not to be true, but here's a report from uh, their, uh, Catherine Herridge on Fox News Sunday this morning about this recent airstrike around Mosul that may have killed, uh, what's his name, uh, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the leader of ISIS. I, I, I don't know if, like I said, I don't know if that's true or if it just is a rumor, but here's the report from Fox News Sunday this morning here. On Iraq, a defense official confirms that a new series of airstrikes near the Iraqi town of Mosul, close to the Syrian border, targeted the leadership of ISIS, with intelligence suggesting a meeting of senior operatives possibly including the Islamic State leader Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. A convoy of 10 heavily armed trucks was destroyed. Damage assessments are ongoing, and a defense official had no further information on the status of the ISIS leader. Chris? So, yeah, like I said, I, I don't know if that turned out to be true or uh, later, I'm sure within a day or two, or uh, who knows how they do these assessments, but... Uh, I don't know if that would change the uh, strategic situation, it, you know, because he's the guy. It's a, a caliphate, and he's the guy who called himself the caliph. Or the I, I'm sure he must have some successor, I, but I don't know if he would, uh, how it would affect the situation. You know, if you saw some clips on previous shows, he was sort of like a, a, a cult leader-like figure, so according to s some sources. So it, that might be important if that turns out to be true, but like I said, I don't really know if it's true or not. Uh, and that was the last clip on the whole ISIS Iraq Syria situation. I want to show a few clips here at the end on the uh, upcoming 2016 presidential election and what the sort of midterm elections, what the implications are. Uh, first, there's this interesting analysis from Chuck Todd on NBC's Meet the Press where he talked about the midterm results and how they show that there are actually more uh, states in play, more battleground states possibly. For 2016, uh, which I'll talk about a little more after I show you that clip here. Still 730 days until a new president is elected. The results of the midterms this week can give us a hint of where the battle for the White House will be fought in 2016. So 
Let's go to the map. These nine states in yellow, of course, made up the battleground in 2012 and probably will again in 2016. Now, let me explain the 242-191 that we start with. The states that are in blue that add up to 242, these are states that Democrats have won in six straight presidential elections. Now, with this cycle, they hope to add to their sort of permanent blue wall here. They were hoping with victories in Florida, Virginia, Iowa, Colorado, that in a midterm year, if they were to hold and win races there, that they would be able to say to the Republicans, you can't win there in 2016. But guess what happened? Republican wins in Colorado, Iowa. Put those two states right back in the battleground. Florida governor, Rick Scott eked it out again, back in the battleground. Virginia, Mark Warner may have won, but it took us till Wednesday to find out, back in the battleground. Speaking of the battleground, how about Wisconsin? If Scott Walker keeps winning there, you gotta put that one back in the battleground. Minnesota and Michigan, by the way, Senate races that Republicans thought they could make competitive, they didn't, not making it into our battleground. Now, there is some good news here if you're Democrats. Look at a few other states that may have been added to the battleground as well. Take Georgia. Yes, David Perdue won 53-45, but it was a wave year. He got 53% in a good Republican year in Georgia. Folks, Georgia's back on the battleground. Then take a look at Arizona. They had five Democratic members of Congress running for re-election. Four of them are coming back, and the fifth, when all the votes are counted, may indeed come back. Arizona, back in the battleground. So there you go. The Democratic blue wall may be down to 232 rather than 242 by throwing in Wisconsin. But the Republican wall is now down to 164. For now, look at this. It's a pretty impressive battleground map. It goes from coast to coast, multiple time zones. Who's to say there isn't going to be a decent amount of people actually feeling the presidential election? So, yeah, that was kind of an interesting analysis uh, where Chuck Todd showed that there may be these additional states in the battleground. You know, when I, I showed that clip earlier on immigration from uh, Ruben Gallego, the new congressperson elect from Arizona, I talked about how there were some there's some good news in Arizona for Democrats that Chuck Todd talked about that there and how that puts Arizona in play. And he also talked about how Wisconsin may be in play because uh, Scott Walker won re-election there. there. There was some hope amongst Democrats that he would be knocked off by, what was her name, uh, Baker? I, I didn't really follow that race that closely, but uh, I guess having won the race now, Scott Walker is ready to sort of enter the 2016 presidential race, at least that's the way it seemed to me when I watched his interview uh, with Chuck Todd on NBC's Meet the Press this morning. First, you can see him trying to claim that he'd make a good presidential candidate, even though the economic record in Wisconsin isn't that great, uh, which Chuck Todd kind of confronts him with uh, over in this clip. About uh, the Wisconsin uh, economic record, do you think it's something that translates nationally? Well, I think in, in our case, certainly we had uh, we had a little bit of a slowdown early on with the protests, but in the last year, we saw the best from September to September, uh, the best private sector job growth we'd seen in more than a decade. Our unemployment rates down to nine, from 9.2% in 2010 down to 5.5%. Mm -hmm. And I think if you lower taxes, ease regulations, and put the power back in the hands of the people to create jobs, you can do just that, and you can do it all across the country. But I gotta, I gotta show you, compared to the national average, when it comes to uh, wage growth, it's down, it's below the national average. When it Wisconsin is, when it comes to job growth, it's below the national average. And your tax cut policy has created a, a larger deficit, $1.8 billion deficit hole that you're going to have to plug next year. And part of it is because revenues, state revenues, didn't come in as expected. Is it possible that the idea of cutting taxes as a way to create jobs and stimulate the economy just isn't working in Wisconsin? No, that's just the opposite. The reason revenues are down is because we cut withholding. Withholding at the state and the federal level is where the government takes more of your money than you actually owe them and holds on to them without giving you interest. We cut that in April, so we anticipated uh, that reduction in revenue because we gave the hardworking taxpayers more money back. And that $1.8 billion is based on a projection of no growth and no changes to the budget. That just doesn't happen. In our case, if we have the average of the last five years revenue growth, we actually have the next budget starting with more than a half a billion dollars in surplus. So the simple answer is you compare us to Illinois, where they raise taxes, we lower taxes by $2 billion in property and income, and we have a much, much lower unemployment rate and a much better economy than they do. Thank God they elected Bruce Browner because they'll help turn things around down there just like we have in Wisconsin. No one. 
I don't know. Uh, I mean, the answer sounded kind of slick, like he is planning to run for president, but I, I don't think that answer really explained the numbers that Chuck Todd showed there. And, I mean, I hope he does run for president. It, it would be great if he were nominated. I think it would really energize uh, labor and the, uh, the uh, union base of the Democratic Party, especially because of what he's done with public sector unions. Uh, which Chuck Todd actually asked him about, uh, and you can see how he tried to sort of minimize what he's done uh, over in this clip. Having to do with the collective bargaining issue in Wisconsin. There has been sort of a, uh, an agreement, I guess, over the years, that if you come into the public sector, teacher, firefighter, police officer, that in exchange for not getting a private sector-like salary opportunity, uh, that you will get a pension. Uh, you will have protected retirement in, a, in the form of a pension, which, of course, many in the private sector don't get. Do you believe still in that basic agreement? Well, in the end, I, I think a, providing for good, decent, hardworking public servants is a good thing, and we still do. When I did all this, my brother, uh, David's a banquet manager. His wife sells appliances right. at Sears. They are a classic American working family. He said, I'd love to have the deal you're offering public employees. We match their pension requirement. Uh, we asked them to pay just over 12% for their health insurance. The average family in our state is paying 20 to 25%. Mm -hmm. So we still provide a pretty good deal. And the benefit is they don't have to pay union dues so anymore. So you They're still free believe in There's pension? No seniority or tenure. You still believe in the pension yeah, system we, for government workers? We, we, we have the only fully funded pension system in the country because of our reforms and because of the reforms that were put in even before. <laughs> so, yeah, again, the, that uh, answer is uh, slick, but not really a, a good explanation of what he did to the unions in Wisconsin, I don't think. And then the last clip I want to show from uh, Governor Scott Walker there that I think really shows he's running for president. First, when uh, Chuck Todd brings up his pledge to serve out his term, he talks about it being a plan instead of a pledge. You can see Chuck Todd kind of raise his eyebrows about that. And then you can see him like go into his riff, his anti-Hillary Clinton riff, uh, in response to questions about uh, Paul Ryan, uh, also from Wisconsin, uh, possibly running for president because he was vice president uh, nominated uh, last time around. Anyway, here's... Uh, you can see Scott Walker pretty much sounding like he's running for president uh, in this last clip of his interview on NBC's Meet the, Meet the Press this morning here. I got to ask you about 2016. You made a pledge in October that you were going to serve all four years. Does that pledge still hold? I said my plan was for four years. I've got a plan to keep going for the next four years. Um, but, you know, certainly I care deeply about not only my state but my country. We'll see what the future holds. Do you defer to Paul Ryan? I love Paul Ryan. I, I've said many times before I'd be the president of Paul Ryan fan club. But I do think if we're going to beat Hillary Clinton in the next election, we've got to have a message that says Hillary Clinton is all about Washington. Mm -hmm. I think in many ways she was the big loser on Tuesday because she embodies everything that's wrong with Washington. We offer a fresh approach. Any of us, now 31 governors across the country, have the executive experience from outside of Washington to provide a much better alternative to the old, tired, top-down approach so you we see out of Washington, D.C. We need something fresh, organic, from the bottom up. And that's what you get in the states. You're not deferring to Paul Ryan then. It sounds like you believe a governor, not a member of Congress, should be the Republican nominee. Paul Ryan may be the only exception to that rule, but overall, I believe governors right. make much better presidents than members of Congress. <laughs> so you tell me, do you think uh, Scott Walker's running for president? It sounded pretty clear to me, uh, especially from that answer, but from all three clips I showed of him that uh, he is starting his 2016 president presidential run right now. Uh, and he's uh, gearing up to run against Hillary Clinton. I guess she's the presumptive Democratic nominee, even though she hasn't announced. Uh, one person who might challenge her, I guess, is Senator Bernie Sanders from Vermont. I showed a clip of him earlier, and I want to end with him uh, uh, talk, g giving some good progressive rhetoric on the uh, effect of billionaires on our political system. You know, I, I just did a liberal viewer first Wednesday live Q&A uh, last Wednesday where I talked about uh, uh, pl uh, campaign finance and my views on uh, putting limits on certain things in Citizens United, which aren't mainstream liberal views, I guess, uh, or depends on how you define liberal, I guess. But anyway, here's Bernie Sanders. I, I agree about uh, with about half of what he says uh, in terms of Citizens United and the effect of billionaires, and I agree with billionaires and the need for public financing, but not so much the Citizens United and 
uh, one other part, which I'll talk about after I show you that last clip for the show tonight here. The essence of the problem is not that California is a big state and Vermont's a small state. The yes. essence of the political crisis in America is that you have billionaires making huge campaign contributions, yeah. having a Congress no. working for them not and not for ordinary people. So what you really need to do is overturn this disastrous Citizens United Supreme Court decision. Right. And which, Bernie, you can't do because the Senate is full of people who represent oh. crows. All right. Well, there are ways to get around that. But the other thing you have to do is move to public funding of elections. All right. So if I run against you, I don't have any more money it's than really you. Hmm. Of course, public funding of elections doesn't necessarily mean if I run against you, I don't have any more money than you. It's more about making sure that people have a floor uh, because... Um, one thing I've talked about that not everyone agrees with, I guess, is that the candidate with the most money isn't necessarily the one that wins. As long as every candidate has a certain floor, a minimum amount of money, and a, a minimum amount of airtime through public financing, you don't have to worry about who has the most money uh, as long as you have enough money to get your message out there. And that can also, especially with the Internet and small donations, Obama showed that you can raise a lot of money uh, and... Anyway, uh, I don't want to go into the whole campaign finance issue, but I, I do agree about public financing, and I do agree about the effect of billionaires. Not so much the uh, Citizens United isn't about billionaires, it's about corporations and their independent expenditures, and I'm not going to go into that whole issue again. If you're really interested in that, check out my Liberal Viewer First Wednesday Live Q&A from last week. I also promised that I was going to... Uh, finish up this uh, video on the Sam Harris quote here. Uh, I had, unfortunately, some medical issues this week, and of course the election. Uh, uh, I even did some stuff volunteering for the Democratic Party as a, uh, a election attorney, or like a, in case there were any problems with the uh, uh, voters at the uh, polling places, uh, although I didn't end up having to do anything, but I was on call and did a little training on that, so I got a little behind, but that should be finished soon and uh, also if you're watching this is a recorded show if you look up oh no no that way up in this corner there should be a little place where you can help sponsor this uh, channel so I don't have to put commercials every 15 minutes in these shows it, it will still be every half hour this week because I did get some more donations to the support liberal viewer uh, link there that's also on my channel page uh, I'm really have to finish up the show I've been reading your comments along the way uh, I appreciate the 90 or 100 of you who have been watching most of the time. I saw some, you've been arguing with each other. There was even some talk about trolls. Someone even asked, uh, I tried to reply to a comment asking if I would ban trolls. And if you look over on my Liberal Viewer channel page where you can also do that support Liberal Viewer uh, donate button, there's also, if you click on about there, I um, tell you the rules that I use to ban people. And uh, nothing I've seen in the comment section uh, rises to the level of uh, violating my pretty liberal free speech rules on my channel. So, sorry, I'm not going to be banning people, although I agree when I try to read through the comment section, it's very difficult to see what's going on. So, uh, I wish it weren't so hard. I wish I uh, could read the comments and get a little live discussion going, but uh, I've actually been doing the show for longer than I expected, and I, I need to finish up. Uh, it's over an hour and 40 minutes at this point, so uh, thanks for joining me. I'll be uh, doing the show again next week at 6.30 p.m. Pacific Time, Liberal Viewer Sunday live clip roundup. Who I, I don't know what the topics will be, but I hope you enjoyed the clips I picked out on uh, the topics of the week uh, for what the corporate media here in the United States thought was important. I picked out what I thought were the best clips, and... Uh, I guess I'll be seeing you all around the internet.